only in Moscow would have assumed that American Airlines was conspiring against me. <laughs> we Americans never believe in conspiracies. Thank you for coming tonight. I didn't think I would ever lecture on geopolitics in Moscow, because being my age, Moscow was a place of danger and darkness. <laughs> and now I see it's not. So let's talk about Stratfor for a second and its name. The origin of its name, its name really, is strategic forecasting. In 1995, when we started the business, and it is a business, we are freer by selling what we know than by asking for money from the government or things like that. Uh, when we started it, uh, I decided that it was too hard to type www.strategicforecasting.com. So we shortened it to Stratfor, because after all, who was going to use the internet? I mean, it's not important. Out of that, we got the name Stratfor. I wouldn't have picked it myself. It grew. I had no choice. And this is the first lesson to begin with. We live with some choices, but mostly they are the illusion of choices. We think we can shape our lives any way we want, but in fact, our lives are severely constrained. If that were not true, then we could predict nothing. The entire idea of forecasting is based on the idea of some sort of necessity. And out of that necessity comes prediction. I wrote a book a few years ago in which I predicted that there would be a conflict between Russia and the West, particularly the United States, over Ukraine. It was not a isolated guess. It derived from a method. That method allows us to think through some things, not perfectly, but it's not magic. And it's not guesswork, and it's not luck. And it is the heart of intelligence. In the end, all intelligence is about forecasting. Whether you are going to get a bit of information that will allow your president to know what the American president will say at the next meeting, or whether you're going to predict the future of your country. This is the task of intelligence. Okay. Now, many in intelligence believe that the purpose of intelligence is to pass around bits of paper to each other and have arguments with each other. Who will get what budget? But that is a side, a very important side product, a byproduct of intelligence. The core of intelligence is knowing what will happen somehow and in some way. So how do we do this? Well, we begin by appreciating two things. All of us are born someplace. And where you are born makes a tremendous difference in what choices you have. If you are born in Iceland, or if you are born in the Congo, or if you are born in New York, or if you are born in Smolensk, the moment of birth, many things drop away as possibilities. And the heart of forecasting is understanding that which is impossible. Not what is possible, what is impossible. So if you are born to a poor family in the Congo, enormous amounts of things are impossible. And I can predict to some degree what your life will be like. If you are born to a very wealthy family in New York, other things are impossible. I can't become a beggar, where it's very unlikely. There are many things I can't be. So when we consider a human being and the moment of birth, we already see how much falls away. And that which remains becomes the sheaf of possibilities. And then we discover that you're not very smart. 
and we discover that you are very smart. And we discover that you can't get along with other people. And we discover that you are wonderful with people and on and on. And as these things from your birth emerge, the choices in your life become narrower and narrower and narrower. And as you grow older and you fall in love and you get married, this closes off other opportunities. And as you decide to become a student at this university, this opens up opportunities and closes opportunities. So think of the individual life and how much choice there is. When you reach my age and you look back on it, life actually starts to make sense. What appeared to be a series of random incoherent choices that I would create a company in Texas that does strategic forecasting, which I never imagined would be the case. It happened, sort of. But when I look back, I say, where else could it all wind up? I was interested in intelligence. I was interested in forecasting. I couldn't stand the place I was. What else could I have done? But I was an American, hence this was possible. Had I been Chinese, this may not have been so possible. And so when you have a close, almost molecular understanding of a life, you can look back on it and see that it tells a story. And that story is not a surprise. Who is it the greatest surprise to? To the person who lived it. To that person, it's a surprise. So that when you talk to decision makers, they very rarely know why they're making the decision. They're dealing with this moment. They don't see where it's leading. It's when you step back at a distance that you can begin to see the tapestry. And this is what Machiavelli said in The Prince, in the introduction, when he said, Forgive me, my prince, for writing these things about you, but sometimes it is easier to see the truth at a distance from the mountain than sitting on the mountaintop. And this was a critical lesson. The intention of people and what comes out of it are very different. It is the unintended consequences, unintended in the sense of it was not subjectively what you wished or thought you wished, it is the unintended consequences that you can see if you're not that person. It is much easier for me to see what will happen to one of you if I really knew you than for you to see. Because your views are filled with wishes, illusions, desires, misconceptions. I have no such burden. And so those who think that intelligence is finding out what the president thinks of either of our countries will be badly delusioned, disillusioned. Presidents are more like each other than they are like us. Why? If you're the president of the United States, 330 million people. If you're the president of Russia, I, I don't know how much the count is now, 180 million, I think. I'm not sure. 120, I'm sorry. But 140, but one of you is worth more than just one, so it's all right. <laughs> the point is, to become the leader of a country requires a certain extraordinary discipline. You don't just bop along, as we say in the States, and one day, hey, why don't I become president? You focus your life on power. And the ability to focus yourself so ruthlessly, so in a disciplined way, that you, among all the hundreds of millions of others who could become president, that you are the one who becomes that, shapes you in an extraordinary way. It doesn't necessarily make you nicer. It doesn't necessarily make you smarter. But there's one thing that the president of the United States and the president of Russia have in common. They know how to be president, and they knew how to become president. And so if we begin with that understanding, and we take a look at what they worry about every day, do they worry about 30 years from now? Do they worry about 
what will happen in the area of computing. They worry about how to remain president. And in that worry, that shapes their mind. And out of the, their actions come the unintended consequences. When I was younger and we were studying your country, the Americans, like your people, tried to get every bit of information they could get out of your Politburo. And the assumption was the higher you went, the more they knew. And if you could only get their telephone conversations, their emails or mails at that time, if you just got those, you would know what would happen. And one of the interesting things was that those who followed all of the details of what Gorbachev and every other member of the Politburo were saying were the last to know what would happen. Because Gorbachev was the last to know what was going to happen. The assumption that source-based intelligence operates from is that the knowledge of long-term events is contained in the leader's head. The leader isn't even thinking about long-term events, sometimes not even about short-term events. He's trying to figure out how to stay present. The danger of source-based intelligence, which both our countries love, is that you assume the source has any idea of what he's talking about. You say, well, he's deputy minister of foreign affairs, or he's deputy assistant secretary of state. Surely he knows. I've known deputy assistant secretary of state, and I can assure you they have no idea. Their question is, how can they become deputy secretary of state? Their question is, how can they move their careers? It is not exclusively that. They also want to deal with their jobs, their countries, and everything else, but they're focused on the moment. And so if you ask them what will happen, they will tell you what they wish would happen. They will tell you what they think you want to hear. Sources are the most dangerous thing in intelligence. They're the most dangerous thing in intelligence not because they lie, of course they lie. Not because you'll misinterpret them, of course you'll misinterpret them. They're dangerous because they have no content. They have no knowledge. And this we find over and over and over again. Hitler did not think he would have to commit suicide in the bunker. Stalin did not think he would be invaded. Only Churchill had some idea, but not much. The point is not that they're stupid. It is that they're not focused on the things you may be focused on. They may not be clear on that. That may not drive them. So the most important thing that we have to do whenever we talk to a friend is understand what they're thinking. But that's impossible because you can't read their minds. Much better to understand the forces that are shaping them. A friend who wants to be a Hollywood actor, who's incredibly ugly, probably you know this is not going to happen unless they need very ugly people. And every once in a while. So if you think about life of the individual, you will begin to understand how often your friends are delusional and you have a better idea of what's going to happen to them. And you can do strategic forecasting of their lives. And you do. And this is called gossip. <laughs> and all of you do. And you listen, and you analyze, and you think, and you understand what's going to happen. Now, along with birth comes something that I call love of one's own. You are born to a mother. And your mother may be an idiot, vicious, but you love her. Why? Because it is the most natural thing in the world, the easiest love, the first love. And if your father's there, most of your fathers, I think, you know, would be there, you would love him too. This requires no thought. And this is a driving element, because if you love them, you derive your language from them, maybe your religion from them, maybe your hatred of religion from them, maybe they hate religion, therefore you love religion from them, but your life is shaped by them. 
and their lives in turn were shaped by previous generations, and here you have history. And they don't live alone, they live in a community. It could be a tribe, a Greek polis, or modern nation state. But when you are born in a nation state, you have a language, you have a set of beliefs. We're not all philosophers, we don't all invent our <laughs> beliefs. And we also have a commitment, and this is the beginning of geopolitics. Because the most important question of geopolitics is simply this. Why would anyone rush a machine gun position? Empirically, we know they will. Empirically, we know this is a fact. But it is the first mystery of geopolitics. Because utilitarian philosophers say that all men act out of pleasure. And you'd say, I've known a utilitarian philosopher who said he gained greater pleasure being killed by a machine gun position than living. This is a, a point of absurdity that you reach when you push hedonism and utilitarianism so far. It is because there is an element of courage and a courage that flows from community. And out of this community flows not only love of one's own, but distrust of others. Because there are two ways to make money. One is to work, the other is to steal. Stealing is easier. So everyone around you may have a motive, but certainly among nations, the fear of each other is as natural as the love of, love of one's own. So when we talk about nation and place that you're born, and the time you're born, you must also think about the nation into which you were born. Because your fate and that nation's fate are bound up. There are Americans who say, well, you know, I don't believe in being an American. I believe that, uh, you know, I'm a citizen of the world. This is very good in a very powerful country where nobody can attack you. In a small and weak country, there is no illusion that you have a free fate. Your fate as Russians is your fate. It is bound up with the fate of your country. It may be you can do nothing about it, but that fate is important. It determines something. So, in modern times, there's a belief that we are all individuals shaping our way in the world. And what I've been arguing is this is the grand illusion. You are Russians. I know you're Russians. I'm an American. We have some issues, you and I. And you may say, it's not your issue. Well, okay. Then when the bombs start to fall, I will say, don't bomb Charlie over here, or Igor, because he doesn't think it's his issue. The idea of shared fate is an inevitability. You cannot oppose it. When we look at nations, we also notice that they have certain imperatives. Russia has an imperative. Its enemy is normally to the West. Napoleon, the Austro-Hungarians, the Kaiser, Hitler, all came from the West. The devastation to Russia was catastrophic. What saved you was buffer zones. They had to go a long way to get to Moscow. And each of them failed to reach there. So, why did they fail to reach there? It was a long way. And that bought you time. And so Zhukov's armies could come from Siberia and stand in front of Moscow. And if there wasn't so much time, and it wasn't so far, all of your history would be different. So what is your imperative? You must have strategic depth. Everybody must have strategic depth. The United States is an island, except for that little bit of Panama. North America is an island. What is the American imperative? That the oceans should be American. 
Because if the oceans are American, no one can come. We can invade Iraq, and the Iraqis can't invade us. This is good if you're an American, not if you're an Iraqi. <laughs> but in this world, the illusion of humanity is a dangerous one. Because I'm not an Iraqi, and they are not Americans, and we have different fates. So if I establish the principle of unintended consequence, which I want to start with, and lead you to the idea that you are born inevitably to a place, and your fate is bound up with that place, then I must think about what is the nature of the problem facing that place, and how will it solve it. And if you think about that, which is that Russia must have buffers, and the United States must have the sea. And it really doesn't matter if it's Obama or George W. Bush or Bill Clinton. And suddenly, they who are so focused on being a president can't really think about the broader question of what, what is the imperative that drives them. And there are also constraints. Russia has very poor rivers. They don't go together. They don't go to where they need to go. The transportation system is weak, always difficult. This shapes Russia. The United States has only 36 people per square kilometer without Alaska. We don't have enough people, which, believe it or not, can be a serious problem. We have our constraints. You have yours. I'd rather have America's than Russia's. But we all have constraints. For some, it means constant national catastrophe, Poland. For others, it means difficulties. For others, it means successes. If you understand the underlying constraints within the nation state, you can begin to understand what will happen and how they will behave. So let's begin a little understanding. Without talking about leaders or presidents or what President Putin's mood is this week, or does he like Obama, does Obama like him? I can assure you, neither care the least about each other. They're presidents, they like who they need to. Let's begin with the year 1992, the year that everything changed. There's a long cycle that began in 1492, when Europe began the process of conquering the world. Up until that point, the Zulus didn't know the Eskimos, the Japanese had never heard of the Aztecs. The world was fragmented. What the Europeans did in two, three hundred ruthless, bloody years was tear apart all of these sequestered worlds and jam them together into one. From 1492 to 1992, there was always a European power, which was the leading global power. Spain, France, Britain. There's always one. In 1992, for the first time, there was not a single European global power. Because the Soviet Union, the last European global power, fell. It fell apart. And all the others were at best regional powers, if that. There was now only one global power in the world, the United States. And for the first time in 500 years, the center of gravity of the global system moved from Europe to North America. And North America, of course, was also the only country, continent, native to both the Atlantic and the Pacific, in the Pacific age, was able to trade in both efficiently and also was able to control the seas. Very important. But 1992 was more than just the end of the long cycle and the beginning of a new one. It was also the fall of the Soviet Union, of course. But in that year, the Japanese economic miracle stopped being miraculous. Tiananmen Square happened in 91. 
which defined what China would be like for the next 20 years. Operation Desert Storm defined the Middle East, gave rise to Al-Qaeda. Tremendous operation, okay? So this was a moment in which everything came together. And of course, no one at the time knew it. They didn't realize it for a moment. It was all separate things. But what the world did was have a major upheaval. What emerged from this was three pillars of the international system. The United States, about one quarter of the world's GDP, at that time was like 30%. Uh, control of all the world's oceans, no power had ever had that in the world, in history. Um, this was one pillar. The second was Europe. The Maastricht Treaty had been signed in 92. And 91, and in 92 it was assumed that Europe would come together not just economically, but politically and militarily, become a counterweight to the United States, and regain its position as a global power, not alone, but together. And the third was China. In every generation, there is a country that has low wages and high growth rates. Before China was Japan, which was going to overtake the entire world. And in 1880 was the United States, low wages and high growth. So these are the three pillars on which it was founded. In 2008, in seven weeks, two events undermined this world and began changing it. The first on August 8th was Russia's return to history with its war with Georgia. I won't say invasion because you get insulted. <laughs> but at that moment, Russia announced that its history wasn't over. Russia announced that it would act. It also acted because the United States was in the middle of, de of uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and couldn't do anything about it. But it acted. Russia was back. And all of the truths on which Europe was built all of the assumptions that America had made were wrong. Russia was not yet a great power or anything like that, but it was back. The second event occurred on September 15th, 2008. Lehman Brothers collapsed. And the collapse of Lehman Brothers created a global crisis which undermined the international financial system shattered Europe and undermined China. The United States staggered, then recovered. But an entirely new world was created. Lehman Brothers destroyed the old world. Georgia began defining the new one. Okay. Why did the Russians invade Georgia? Many reasons, but one was to say to Kiev, this is what American guarantees are worth. It was a very good lesson to the for countries of the former Soviet Union. And at that time, that's what American guarantees were worth. Now, Europe had this problem. At the center of Europe is Germany, and Germany exports 50% of its GDP. It needs the European Union because half of that goes to the European Union without tariffs or controls. It needs the European Union. But it also undermines Europe. It undermines Europe because how can you develop in a world where Germany, the fourth largest economy, is spewing out product into your market, competing with everything you do? Plus, has the rules of Brussels which basically guarantee there is no Google coming in Germany. Siemens is safe. Okay. How can it do that? The crisis created a sovereign debt crisis, which means countries couldn't pay their debt because suddenly their economies were staggered beyond management. And the question was, would Germany bail out the rest of Europe or would the rest of Europe have to undergo austerity 
which is a nice word for saying devastating poverty. And the Germans said, let me think about this. We could pay for it, or you could pay for it. I know, you pay for it. <laughs> it was a very difficult thing geopolitically to predict what the Germans would say. Now, if I can show you a map, this is not easy. <laughs> This is what happened to Europe. This is the unemployment rates in the south of Europe. And if you break it down by countries so south and north, what you realize is southern Europe has the same unemployment rate as the United States had in the Great Depression. Southern Europe is in a massive depression. France, not doing so well. Germany is just fine. Remember, I said a nation had a shared fate. Imagine if in the American system, Texas had said, we're not going to help New York. Well, Texas would like to say that, <laughs> but it's not an option. A shared fate is a foundation of a nation state. This is not a nation state, this is a treaty organization where every power rests with each individual nation. And so what you're seeing here is the fragmentation of Europe back into the constituent nation states. When President Hollande meets Frau Merkel, it is not two European leaders talking, it is the President of France and the Chancellor of Germany, and each are speaking about their own national interests. And they can, can't agree on anything. Because Germany's interests are fundamentally different from that of Italy. And therefore, I don't need to know what Merkel thinks to know what Merkel thinks. She must protect her chancellorship, and she can't do that if she's giving away money to the Southern. And I know what the Southerners think. And so the European Union, which was once a great idea, it is, I'm not arguing it's going to fail, it's failed. When you see the map, you see failure. The question is, how will they conduct the ballet at the end? Because these numbers, 24% of Spain, is not something you take care of in six months. It takes a generation to get rid of those numbers. And the numbers are worse than they appear because they don't take into account, for example, that in Greece, they cut em state employees' salaries. And doctors and architects and lawyers are state employees. And we know somebody who earned three thousand dollars a month as three thousand euros a month as an engineer, and they cut his pay to eight hundred dollars a month. And he will never recover that. And he knows that his future is devastated. And these are the people who constitute the radical right groups in Spain, the radical left left group, Podemos. They are bitter, they are angry. And this is Europe. And these are numbers you have not seen in Europe since the 1920s. And these were the numbers that gave rise to little men with mustaches. It is an enormously dangerous situation. All the more so that the European financial elite doesn't see it. If you read the Financial Times, the banks are okay, so what's the problem? There's the problem. China had a cyclical downturn. We knew it was going to have one. There's always a replacement. but. China's problem was that it wanted to have full employment. To have full employment, it needed to have exports. And Germany and China had the same problem. If you're a great exporting power, you depend on the appetite of your customers for your well-being. If your customers don't want your oil or won't pay the price you need, you're hostage. The strength of the United States, we export 11% of our GDP. Three quarters of that to Canada and Mexico. We are not a great exporting power. So what happened was, was that China weakened. Because to keep people working full time, they had to lend money to companies that should go out of business because they were inefficient. And the lending of money rose up the price of wages, so the Chinese wages are now higher than Mexico's. 
And this is why Chinese companies are moving to Mexico or Russia or anywhere else they can get cheaper wages. This is capital flight, not health. They're running away. So the third pillar, the United States, went a little crazy. After 9-11, it went to war with everybody. Afghanistan, Iraq, whoever. But it wasn't an all-out war. We lost 4,000 people, and my daughter was in the military, so I feel that. She was there. But it was not all-out war. It didn't break us the way the European Union was broken, the way China is not broken, but changing the way it behaves, as Japan did before it. One of the outcomes of this, of course, was that as Europe weakened, Russia strengthened. Russia was going to strengthen anyway. The situation in the 1990s was, could not sustain itself. The one entity in the Soviet, in Soviet Union, in the Russian Empire, that was powerful, the security apparatus reasserted itself. If it had not been Putin, it would have had another name. But it was the only stabilizing force that could rectify the disaster. So in looking at Russia, you could predict that either Russia would collapse, which was not necessary, or a stabilizing force would emerge and very quickly identify what the stabilizing force was, like it or not. And that had certain consequences because of the nature of the force. But it did create a stable entity that built a new economic strategy of exporting energy and other things with the intention of building up from that money a more stable economy. And he promised to reassert Russia as a serious force, which had been held in contempt at Kosovo by the West, where it didn't care what they had to say. Okay. Now, because no one cared what Russia said, NATO moved into the Baltics. But of course, NATO was a joke because to, it was a military alliance, and to have a military alliance, you had to have a military. And most of the Europeans had no military. So it became a club for nice people. <laughs> we wouldn't do anything for you, but we invite you to Brussels to have lunch and make speeches. The United States, however, and this is important, had a long-standing strategy going back a century, which most people don't realize. Their one goal was that no single power would gain hegemony over all of Europe. Because Europe, under one power, was the only thing that could threaten the United States by building fleets. Because their greatest fear was Germany and Russia united by whatever means. German technology, German capital, Russian natural resources, Russian manpower, this was a threat to us. In World War I, we carried out the first phase of the strategy. Let them fight. If it looks like one is going to win, get in on the weaker side. So three weeks after the Tsar abdicated, the United States declares war, rushes a million people to Europe, stabilizes the French, defeats the Germans. At Versailles, prevents the Germans from being destroyed, makes sure that there's a German threat to France, and goes home all the time having very pious speeches. In World War II, the United States stayed out of the war, really, until June 1944. Until that point, it was content to let the, the Russians, you, bleed and destroy the Wehrmacht. When the Wehrmacht was done, but before you got to Europe, to Central Europe, the United States invaded. You got Bulgaria, we got France. We did okay. In the Cold War, the entire issue was about the same thing. Germany, Russia, and their fate. And we had the same strategy. An alliance structure, let them fight, and if war breaks out, we'll come in. What did Russia think would happen if they started pushing the United States in Syria? I don't say there's any connection because I don't know it's in anybody's mind. But Russia had become more powerful, more assertive. 
President Putin said there was a coup in Kiev. I don't know what a coup is, but certainly, very openly, the United States supported the demonstrators. It made square. It wasn't a secret. Is it a coup if it isn't secret? I don't know. These are words I don't understand. What did happen is the United States, facing serious challenge in Syria, happened a few months later to give Russia a problem that it can't solve. Now, this also solves a problem for the United States. Europe is weak, Russia is emerging, the threat of a hegemon is re-emerging. Europe can't withstand Russian power, Poland can't, Romania can't, only an alliance structure that actually has some teeth can. And once again, the United States waits. But it waits by posing problems. And the problem of Ukraine is clear. The American strategic imperative has been in place for a century. Any time a serious challenger to European hegemony emerges, we act. We watch the Germans, we watch the Russians, we worry about the Germans and the Russians together. But in the meantime, we like very much the situation where the Russians are held back to the East. The Russians have an imperative. They cannot allow Ukraine to be in the hands of enemies. They don't have to dominate it, but it must be neutral. It must be a real buffer. And so, you wind up in the situation we're in now. Totally predictable. So when I saw Russia rising, when I saw Europe weakening, when I know what the United States does, even though it doesn't think about it, I can tell you that you are in a situation where there is no easy solution. Russia cannot give America guarantees that will calm it. The United States can't give Russia what it wants and needs. Wars do not break out, conflicts do not break out because he's not nice and I am. They, sometimes it is. <laughs> but it, they break out because of fundamental differences. And we have now faced a fundamental difference. So I began by talking about your friend who's ugly wanting to be in Hollywood. And I wound up talking about the Ukraine. In a certain sense, they're the same subject. In a certain sense, they're the same thing. It is seeing the thing that is right before your eyes. Every intelligence agency thinks that if they steal it, it must be true. The truth, the most important truth, is right there. You look at how a nation behaves, how it must behave, what the constraints are, what the realities are, and you know that Russia will frighten the United States. And you know that the United States has options, and it will try to thwart Russia. Russia can't live with that. Russia can, the United States can't live with it. And so it goes. It becomes more complicated. There are many complexities that I didn't mention. But this is how strategic forecasting allows you to work. So let me stop and ask questions. I ran over my time, I think. <laughs>